connection between female beauty and male infatuation is one of the most regular sequences of cause and effect observable in everyday life. E.H. Carr, What is History? Hello and welcome back. Chapter 18 appears inside the household of Diego de Miranda and contains a couple of points by his son Lorenzo. The first thing we note is the chapter's header, which does two things. First, it recalls Don Quixote's original madness by referring to the castle or house of the Knight of the Green Coat, suggesting a certain halfway point between the narrator's perspective and that of Don Quixote. Second, it again mocks critics of Don Quixote Part 1 by adding with other extravagant things, which means extraordinary events, but also anything that might possibly distract from the traditional storyline. After a brief description of Miranda's house, which includes a cave where the family's food is stored, the chapter makes a subtle reference to the matter of Dulcinea's ethnicity. When Don Quixote sees a number of large earthen vessels, clay jars, from El Toboso, the knight recites some of Garcilaso's most famous verses, O oh, sweet garments found by me desperately, so sweet and jubilant when God so wished. This will strike some readers as an absurd parody, but given that Garcilaso's verses vindicate the African queen Daido when she was abandoned by Aeneas, and given that the earthen jars that Don Quixote laments were fashioned by Tobosan Moriscos, and given the fact that Philip III had already expelled the Moriscos from Spain in the years prior to Don Quixote Part II, given all this, I say, there is something poignant about these verses. Cervantes reveals Garcilaso's love poetry as having a trans-ethnic agenda as he signals the expulsion of the Moriscos as an inhumane betrayal with solemn consequences for the domestic economy. Cervantes continues to mock superficial readers by having the Morisco translator also avoid cold digressions. Just how this occurs is convoluted. The Christian narrator says the original author painted Miranda's house in great detail, but the translator of this history chose to pass over these and other similar minutiae in silence because they did not accord well with the principal purpose of the history. By ironic contrast, we read also in great detail that Sancho undresses Don Quixote and that our mad Hidalgo then washes himself. He washed his head and face and the water was left the color of whey, the latter detail owing to Sancho's purchase of his black curds, which had turned his master so white. The contrasting colors insinuate race. So we enter a bourgeois world. The lady Doña Cristina wanted to show that she knew how and was able to regale those who visited her house. The narrative also constantly alludes to the Erasmian theme of the oddly insightful insanity of Don Quixote. This takes shape through a series of asides between Miranda and Lorenzo concerning their guest. For example, the father explains to his son that I've seen him perform the craziest acts on earth and then say things so discreet that they erase and undo his acts. Did you know? Modernist author Miguel de Unamuno once said that Don Quixote de la Mancha ought to be the national Bible of the patriotic religion of Spain. At the same time, the topic turns to poetry and education. Don Quixote asks about Lorenzo's poetry, and when the young man displays humility, our knight approves. There is no poet who is not arrogant and does not think of himself as the greatest poet in the world but Lorenzo is magnanimous toward other poets. There's no rule without its exception, and there must be some who are great and do not think so. Don Quixote's response, however, is cynical. Few. The Hidalgo then displays great wit by explaining to Lorenzo, who has entered a poetry competition, that he should strive for second place because first place will be awarded unjustly, either out of deference to a powerful person or due to a bribe. Lorenzo is intrigued and produces another aside. So far, I cannot judge you as insane. Which poet does Don Quixote cite in reference to the clay jars of El Toboso that he sees at the home of the Knight of the Green Coat? A. Francesco Petrarca B. Garcilaso de la Vega C. Francisco de Quevedo 
Correct answer, B. Garcilaso de la Vega. Don Quixote now launches into a long speech on the science of knight errantry. There are new topics here. A knight must be a legal expert, a jurist, with knowledge of distributive and commutative justice, referring to the difficult balance between the rights of the community and those of individuals. Interestingly, Don Quixote avoids the third category of classical justice, that is, legal justice, which involves the state's obligation to its citizens. He also says a knight must be a theologian as well as a physician, which he defines as principally an herbalist. Note this relatively scientific view of medicine. A knight must also be an astronomer, and he has to know mathematics. Don Quixote then cites the virtues of faith, hope, and charity, as well as prudence, justice, fortitude, and moderation. He moves quickly between prosaic and transcendent virtues. A knight must know how to swim and how to shod horses. This is ironic given what we know of the decaying condition of Rocinante's hooves. But he must also be faithful to God and his mistress. And above all else, he must defend the truth even if it costs him his life. This last comment sounds radical, but notice Don Quixote's physical moderation. Has visiting Miranda's household changed our hero? That's all for now. We invite you to watch our next video. Don't miss out on the adventures of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote de la Mancha. To enroll in the course, click on the novel. To subscribe to our YouTube channel, click on Don Quixote. To watch more videos, click on Dulcinea. And to follow us on our social media, click on Sancho Panza.